Brother Branham um, is exhausted. So Gordon Lindsay goes, ah, ah, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Can you imagine? He's got contracts and no crowds. He's got contracts for big auditoriums and, and his main attraction to put, fill the auditorium up and receive the offering to pay all the bills is not there. And so he prays the Lord, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? But 1950, there was a revival afoot and Branham was the head of it. Now the head disappeared. By this time, Oral Roberts had come on the scene with this healing ministry and there was a move of God that would be called the Voice of Healing Revival. There'd be over 150 different, different tent healing preachers running all over America during the 50s and early 60s. And so the Lord said, call these guys together and let them preach and pray for the sick. And so instead of you know, going under and being financially broke and getting sued, he called the different preachers and come together and took the magazine out of Branham's name and made it the Voice of Healing magazine, which is like the magazine that would talk about all the preachers and their articles and their miracles and sell their books and things. It was like their charisma with a better attitude, if I can say it that way. And so it was a, a very powerful magazine. I actually have all of them in my collection and I'm so happy I have them. So I get to see them all and get all the preachers. So, you know, other people's watch cartoons. I read all these revival magazines and get excited again. I was looking at one today in my office. I have all of Dowie's magazines, big old thick things. I thought I need to take those home and start reading them again and get all excited. That makes me happy. I don't know what makes you happy. Hopefully it's not drugs, but it's the Bible. Uh, but this is what makes me happy. Okay. So the meetings take off. Jack Cole would come around. Uh, you have William Branham. You had Morris Cirillo was a young 20 year old evangelist in those days. He was the last, he just died this year. We, uh, uh, Morris Cirillo was the last of the voice of healing preachers of that era. So when Brother Cirillo died, we, there's no more of the preachers alive. Now, there are some people who remember and a few workers left in some of the ministries, but the main preachers are now all gone. It's kind of sad, but I'm glad to see I got to meet some of them before they left and hear their stories. And here there was Rudy Cirillo, there was Mildred Wicks, there was uh, Louise Nyclaville, uh, there was, um, oh, I can just... Trying to think of all, all their names. Tommy Hicks was a part of it. Kenneth Hagen. Oh, Kenneth Hagen is starting his ministry now. He can't get a crowd. He would go to he'd go to a church and teach for a month. In those days, Kenneth Hagen would stay at a church for three weeks to a month and teach twice a day and have 15 people. And that's how he was. And by the time Brother Hagen ended his life, he had the biggest crowds of his time because he obeyed the, the, the revival that God gave him to lead. But he began in the voice of healing era. Everybody still with me? Is this too much information? You all getting bored? Everybody still awake? Uh, I'm, I, I, I love telling all these stories. The voice of healing, guys, uh, Rudy Cirillo said this. He goes, one day I was just a young Christian guy that loved the Lord, and God touched me, and I prayed for people, and they got healed instantly. And my ministry was born. He goes, I can pray for anybody, and they just get healed. That was a wave. That was a, a revival emphasis that God wanted to tell the people of the world that he still heals today and proved it with signs following. And out of 150 evangelists with their tents all over America. Now, let me talk about this. Tents are not special. It's an era, okay? Let me talk about it. Oh, we're going to go back to tent meetings. I hope to God we don't go back to tent meetings. I don't like tent meetings. They are hot. They're sticky. They have bugs. I'm a convention preacher, and I'm glad for air condition and nice walls and chairs. Anybody else with me on that? All right. Now, it's fun. I preached in tents, but people say, I feel the tent meeting coming. That's all by yourself, brother, not with me. The reason why they had tents, let me explain that to everybody. The reason why they used tents, one was there were not buildings big enough for their crowds in America at that time. Now, that's hard for us to recognize because in our time in America and through the world, we have auditoriums of 20,000 and 30,000 and stadiums that will seat 60,000 and they're done properly and they're lighting and recession uh, uh, plans and all that kind of, it's all there. And so they didn't have that back in the 50s. Your biggest auditoriums like in New York, LA, Chicago, Miami, maybe Houston, they weren't big. So a big auditorium was 3,000. Their meetings are drawing 8,000 and 10,000. If Or Roberts, 25,000. Jack Coe, 30,000 at one time. So where do you put those people? So they have to have these canvas cathedrals. And that's why the tents were used. 
Now, if you feel called to be a tent preacher, here's where it works. It works in the third world and the developing nations and in very country places in America. Back in the country towns where they're bored and have nothing else to do, they'll come to your tent meeting, all right? Now, I'm not sure many pastors may support it. You might get one or two, but that's the fact about tent meetings. So if you have a tent ministry, I'm not being negative, but you may want to ask God to upgrade you to a conference hall. And so you could have air conditioned, nice seats, and do it that way. Is that okay with everybody? Now, some of you are of the age that are on here that when you were a child, you went to the tent meetings. So you have this nostalgic type of thing, and that's okay. So I'm not hitting at the authenticity of what was going on at that time in the tent meetings. I'm just trying to update people so they don't go back and live in a mechanics or a natural part of a revival and miss what it was on. The revival is about healing. God wants to heal sick people like he did in the days of the Bible. And he had 150 preachers, maybe a little bit more, uh, but at least 150 traveling evangelists that would be a part of the Voice of Healing magazine and with Gordon Lindsay. And people came by the thousands to these tent meetings and conventions. And they'd have a, a carnival of healing preachers. They'd have four or five over a weekend. Some of the best would come. Well, that keeps going. And Brother Branham recoups. He's now back to normal, feels good, his mind's together, everything's doing good. He wants to come back and do the ministry again. Well, he comes to Gordon Lindsay and says, will you, will you let go of all that and come back and manage me and do my magazine and run my meeting? He goes, no, 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 no. How do I know you won't do this again and be left with all that again? I can't do that. He said, but let me do this. Let me put you in the magazine. We all honor, respect you, and know your callings and your gifts, and you'll be a part and Brother Branham said, okay, isn't that nice? Brother Branham didn't have an ego problem. said, well, I want my own. He goes, I understand. And he became a part of the Voice of Healing magazine and revival. So he would come and do conferences and tent meetings for Gordon Lindsay at these special conventions. And it became a great, great revival. Brother Branham does excitingly and does well. But something happens. Brother Branham begins to make some mistakes. Everybody still with me? All right. Now, everybody follow me. When you study William Branham's life, you have to know when to stop following. Now, let me teach you something that I learned as a young kid, revival historian. I like all these people. I love William Branham. I really do think he was one of the most amazing prophets in the last two or three hundred years. And to me, he is the gold standard of how we look at things. But we can't ignore the whole story. Most of the time, people only talk about the good times. I'm here to talk about when things don't go right so we can learn from it. You can talk about it without being judgmental. I hope you hear that as I talk through these seven weeks with you. When I talk about the stuff that happened, we're like, ah, Amy, don't marry Mr. Hutton. You know, Catherine, don't do this. You know, these are realities that still happen today. So William Branham has to hire people to help him. And he hires the wrong people. Now, they are loyal to him and love him. But let me explain. Let me just, let me um, do this here. This will show you when Brother Branham died, uh, he owed the IRS certain amount of money. Let me find my notes here. And so I can give you the actual, uh, let's see. Uh, in 1956, the IRS filed a tax evasion suit against Branham, who reported his salary of $7,000 a year, while his manager was making $80,000 a year. This was in 1956. Can you imagine what $80,000 was back in 1956? All right. So Brother Branham, hired the wrong people. So when Brother Branham settled uh, uh, for $40,000, he had to pay him back taxes. Now, that to me shows you two things. Brother Branham just loved the Lord, wanted to do the ministry, and did not care about administration, did not care about the money. If you're the top guy, if you're the top family, you're going to have to learn how to manage things and be able to check up on your employees not because you're trying to find fault, but you want to make sure everything is running according to law 
and good business structure and the way you feel it should be done. Brother Branham was an absentee owner of his office. So we have the story here of Brother Branham and all these things begin to happen and the wrong people get around him. All right, let's come back. The wrong people get around him and they begin to say this to him. Brother Branham, there's nobody like you. You're a very special person. No one else is like you. You are, you're an elite person unto the Lord. You're Elijah. You're Elijah. You're like Elijah. They go from you're like Elijah to you are Elijah. Now notice how easy it is to say that in a phrase. You're like Elijah. You're Elijah. It all comes in the same breath, same tone, and but it's two different things. Let me give everybody a prophetic word tonight. Nobody watching me is Elijah. Settle it. Don't somehow spiritualize Old Testament verses and your own dreams. We can have uh, the blessing like Elijah. There can be the spirit of Elijah, but you are not Elijah. Come back. Branham began to believe that because people told him that. Now, this was the beginning of error. When somebody makes a mistake and you're reading their life story and you're following them, let me give you some advice. Do not follow them all the way into their error. Recognize what it is, understand it, but stop receiving from that point in that person's life to the end unless they go wrong and then correct and then you can pick back up and they do right. Branham didn't once. Branham began to go off. He just kept going and going and going until he had a tragic death. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Everybody still with me? Everybody awake? Am I, have I lost anybody? Are we all having prophetic fun or are we all kind of scared now to be prophets? A lot of people should be a little bit scared after I get through telling this story just to be careful, okay? So praise the Lord, everybody. Okay, let me bring everybody back. There we are. So let's talk about some of his errors. And this is, um, well, let me just the way I always tell it. Brandon would say, when you see a casket, a hearse, or a funeral, it's a woman's fault. And people go, oh, especially all the ladies just took a deep breath. <laughs> yeah, I did too. I heard him say it. I read it and I'm like, there must be a, a wrong translation of the tape or the transcription of the tape. There's some, but no, no, that's what he said. And he would say it enough to where people uh, in, in the ministry ranking was like, all right, well, at first I just thought he made a misstatement and didn't catch it and correct it, but he kept saying stuff. Now, this shows you, what I'm about to explain shows you the the lack of biblical structure in his life. Gifted, yes. Anointed, yes. Bible knowledge, small. He might not have been a great Bible reader because he didn't have a great ability to read. So I want to give that as a part of the process here. He believed that the reason why he would make that statement was because Adam and Eve in the garden, that Eve was the woman who took the bite of the apple first, so she caused the whole fall. So from that, all women cause death and destruction in the earth. That's how he processed stuff. Now, folks, you cannot follow that because that is not good theology. That is very bad theology. Even the most simplest Bible school student or even Sunday school person go, what? But he would say things like that. And uh, now here's the problem of the church world. All right, everybody listen. The church world at this time did not know what you and I know and take for granted. They didn't have a revelation on your gifts can work while you're in error because the gifts and calls are without repentance. So Branham's gifts kept working 100%. Gordon Lindsay said, even during the time of Branham's era, said, I've never known William Branham to miss it. He said, in all the years I was with him, all the times I was around him, he goes, I cannot remember a time that Branham in his gifting ever missed anything. Now, that's a great statement. And Gordon Lindsay is a man to be honored and a man to be respected. And when he makes a statement like that, it carries weight. Gordon Lindsay was the man that kept all the preachers and the denominations at friends. He was like the Barnabas of the revival, if I can say it that way. And so he would preach that denominationalism was the mark of the beast. He would accuse people of, of all types of things. And he also preached the serpent seed doctrine. This, I'm going to just give you a few. What is the serpent seed doctrine? It is the doctrinal belief 
that Eve did not eat the apple, but had sex with the devil, had sex. And so that's where there came corruption. And so that was the serpent seed. And so that whole thing got going. So Branham kept calling people out like you saw in the video clip and giving them their word of knowledge of where they live, what's wrong with them, and they'd get healed and then preach stupid stuff and preach flat out stupid false doctrines. But the gift just kept working. Now, the church world just went, how can this be? He must be telling the truth because his gifts are still working. Because the gifts would not work if he was in error. Now, that was the mistake and the lack of biblical understanding that the gifts and the call of God's will work. That this is an unusual, I mean, that blows my mind today. Now, let me just say it like this. I've been in ministry for over 30 years. I preached my first sermon when I was 13 years old. And I am 54 now. And I've been preaching all over the world, over half of the world. And one thing that shocks me to this day is all the crap preachers are doing behind closed doors, but yet their gift and their anoint on the stage is absolutely amazing and shocking and powerful. And it's Jesus in action. But their private life is all messed up. And it's weird. I mean, it's, it's, it's sad. I mean, if I was to tell you there are some evangelists, <laughs> they would sleep with the woman before they go out to preach, and it wasn't his wife. But he could still get people healed. Now, God will only hold his mercy for a season on that kind of behavior, and then he'll deal with it. And so Branham was one of those guys where people just thought, you know, he can't be wrong. He's a prophet. Maybe it's a revelation we don't have. And so error began to come into the full gospel church. He was now the top guy, the most phenomenal ministry of the time. And, and pastors began to not cooperate with his meetings or have him because of the statements and the error he was preaching. Gordon Lindsay tries three times to get to William Branham. The Lord began to deal with him. Go help Brother Branham. Go help him. He's preaching error. Go help him. And so he tried twice, and the people around Brother Branham did not permit Gordon Lindsay to have access to him. He would call and say, I'm coming to a meeting. I would like to see Brother Branham for lunch or breakfast the next day. Uh, I would like to talk to my friend. And the people around him went, no. So the third time Brother Lindsay came, he came unannounced and was able to get a hold of him and got through the, the FBI ushers, as I call them, and, and got to Brother Branham. And he said, when I got to him, I found out I was too late. He is so far gone and self-deceived or self-convinced of these errors. And what insulated him, he said, no matter what I said, it did not move his heart or his attitude. He said, I knew I was too late. Now let's stop for a minute. If God gives you a warning for someone and gives you an urgency or a time to it, may I suggest to you that you change whatever you're doing and you give attention to that because maybe... If Gordon Lindsay had gotten there before he tried, but the guys forbid him, maybe he could have figured out how to show up sooner. Maybe he could have found the door. I don't know. I think it's possible. Because Gordon Lindsay was a good man and loved Brother Branham and just wanted help because he'd helped a lot of other preachers get over their moral problems, their financial issues, their doctrinal issues. So he was known as a man that could help people and keep that which is in error quiet while things are being fixed and then everything's okay. So he was that kind of person, a good man. But he said, I went to Brother Branham, and I knew I was too late. Don't be too late. And don't be too hard-hearted if someone comes to you. To this day, I still listen to the same voice that helped me when I had no ministry or just a vision. And I still listen to sometimes strangers I don't know because I can hear the sound of God in their voice. And when that happens, I'll, I'll listen. Because God does sometimes send people you don't know with the word. That way you really know it's the word of the Lord because they have no knowledge of your life, your family, or what's going on. And, and so you have to be able to discern that. Not everybody that gives me a word was it really the Lord. Sometimes it was just nice encouraging things from somebody. And that's okay. But those other tones, you know. Brother Branham would not be accepted in the churches. His mail would go down from 1,000 letters a week to almost only 100 to 200 a week. So it began to decline. 
The only people that would have him preach, even during the time of error, would be the full gospel businessmen, Dima Shakarian. Dima Shakarian was my friend. His son, Richard Shakarian, was my friend and would preach for me at times. When I started my Bible college in my church in Southern California, we rented the full gospel businessmen's top two floors. For our Bible school was on the second floor and then our executive office was on the top floor. But the corner office in the back of the building was Dima Shakarian's office. And so we couldn't, you know, of course, rent that. He's the founder. He's the, he's the big guy, the full gospel businessman, and a wonderful man. He had had a stroke, so he spoke a little bit slower and a little more difficult. His walk was not as perfect as it used to be. But my office was right outside of his office. So he would come by sometimes and sit in my office and talk to me. Sometimes he'd come into the classroom, which was the chapel area of the auditorium, and um, he would come in and I told the teachers, anytime Dima Shakirian comes through the door, stop your class. And if he wants to tell a story or pray for something or want just to say hi, let him do it. Let the strength, the vitality of the young people get on this man. And uh, he would do that and the students loved him and he was great. So one day I, I was with him and I said, Brother, Brother Shakirian, you knew all these great preachers. You knew Tommy Hicks, you knew Brother Branham, you knew Dr. Charles Price, another great man of God. I said, tell me about William Branham. He goes, he was the most mysterious man I've ever known in my life. He goes, he was truly godly, but he was always somewhere else. He wasn't quite here all the time. And he goes, and his gifting was spooky. He knew everything. He goes, I asked William Branham, Dima Shakirian said, I asked William Branham one time, how do you know all this stuff about the people? And he goes, here's what William Branham told Dima. Now, li listen to this. This is true prophetic talk now. He goes, it's like a wall in front of me, and I put my hands on and I pull myself up, and I look over the wall, and if I look long enough, I can see everything I need to see and more about all the people. Because as I get tired, I start going back, and I can't see as much. As long as I'm over the wall, I can see everything I need to see and just tell people what I see. That's how he explained how his gift worked. Now, for you and I, go like, okay, we get it, but we don't get it. But that's a spiritual thing. He pulled himself up over the wall. Maybe it was the veil. Maybe, I don't know how, but that's the way he described it. And he could see and he could look. And when he got tired, he would go back down and he couldn't see through the wall. He could only see over the wall. That's the way he explained how his gift worked. Does that make any sense to you? Does that make any sense at all? I mean, it does to me to a point. And then I go, what? I, I have both thoughts. Okay. And then uh, I do, the, I have both of me. It goes, prophetic people are beautiful people, but they are kind of strange. And you prophetically have to know to work on not being strange and not being spooky. Learn how to carry the supernatural and your, your gifts in an honest way, a protective way, but not an elite way. Let Jesus be elite. You just be a follower and, and, and use the gifts that God gave you. Everybody still with me? You all tired? Are you okay? All right. Praise the Lord, everybody. So I guess I should look at my notes here. Let, let, let's go ahead and, and, and bring Brother Branham's life to a close. And we're going to do a little more teaching on some stuff, but I want to tip. Kenneth Hagin was a young prophet. And Kenneth Hagin would become the next dominant world prophetic personality. Uh, in our life today, Kenneth Hagin is also a gold standard of prophetic ministry. In the time that that he was alive, I'm glad to say that I heard Kenneth Hagin preach more than anybody else in my life so far. And I saw him move in the spirit and know how he flowed prophetically. And, and to me, I still gauge and, and discern and evaluate things according to that ministerial standard that Brother Hagin had. He was a young prophet. Branham was the senior prophet of the day. And after one of the meetings, one of the voice of healing meetings, uh, they were all going to go out to eat. Brother Lindsay and Brother Hagen and a couple of full gospel businessmen leaders said, let's go out and get something to eat. We're all kind of hungry. Would you want to go, Brother Hagen? He goes, I sure would want to go, but I have a burden of prayer so strong. I've got to get back to my hotel room so I can pray it out. He goes, if I don't get to my room, it's going to happen right here. And so Gordon Lindsay said, well, you know, let's just go pray with Brother Hagen and we'll eat after. So they all go into Brother Hagen's hotel room there. And they said before Brother Hagen even could hit his knees, he was prophesying. And the spirit of the prophet had come on and he began to prophesy. And he prophesied that the prophet of the day would be taken. The hand of the Lord would take the prophet of the day. He would take the prophet of the day. 
that the body of Christ might be saved and that the soul of the prophet might not be lost. And the vision or the word continued. That was the, the paraphrase that I'm giving you. So Gordon Lindsay, being the writer that he was, was writing all this down as Brother Hagin was prophesying it. When it was all over, they got up off their knees and they began to review the prophecy. At first, they thought the Lord was talking about Oral Roberts because they assumed it was Oral. And then they realized Oral's not a prophet. Oral's a heathen evangelist. The prophet is William Branham. God had foretold Gordon Lindsay, Brother Hagin, and the other gentlemen from the full gospel, told him that he was going to be taken. Now, there is a scripture in the Bible that says that God allows the destruction of the flesh for the saving of the soul. It is a rare occurrence, but it does happen. God had to remove Brother Branham from the earth to stop the error from coming to the full gospel churches and corrupting the movement and to save Branham from going so far that his soul might be lost. So the Lord allowed the destruction of his flesh for the saving of the church and the saving of Brother Branham's soul. Now, Here's how Branham dies. It's Christmas time, 1965. In December the 18th, he is driving from Arizona to Jeffersonville, Indiana with his wife in his car. The second car would be in front of his car. That would be his son and his family. And they were driving back to Jeffersonville for Christmas. And so on the night drive, there came a drunk driver down the other side of the road. And the drunk driver almost hit Brother Branham's son's car, but he swerved and was able to make it, and the drunk driver hits Branham's car head-on, bam, and crashes. When they have a head-on crash, they both come up, and Branham hits the steering wheel and his head in the glass. His wife, they said, went through the glass and came back. Now, we have a picture of the car, so they're... they're this is a very rare picture. I don't show this too often. So this is William Branham's car, and this is where his wife would, be die, would die and be raised from the dead, and Branham would be taken from here. So let me, let me tell you the story, but that's the car. Can you look at it? I don't know how anybody survived it. Um, and you know the car still exists. They've got it in some car lot someplace locked up. I, I think I should have that car. Uh, but that's a different story, all right? <laughs> I collect all stuff, even that kind of stuff. So if you have the Branham car, call me, all right? So, yeah, somebody may say, that. yes, I know who has it. They won't tell me. They tell me they've seen it, but they won't tell me who has it. Like, do I have a sign on me? And then they're scared I'll own it because I have a covenant to get stuff. All right, enough on the Branham, <laughs> Branham stuff, all right? Let's talk about the death. Um, he hits... The car gets hit by a head-on drunk driver. He can hardly move his hands. He has broken ribs, chest, the whole bit. But the son comes running. He sees what happens in his rearview mirror, stops the car, runs with all of his might, gets to the side where his mother's on the passenger side of the car, and checks her no signs of life. He runs around on the other side, and Brother Branham is alive and conscious. <laughs> it just... How you saw the car, how anybody could be alive or conscious is phenomenal. And he whispers just very little because he gets hardly talk. goes, how's mom, meaning his wife, his son's mother. And he said, dad, mom is gone. And he whispers, put my hand on her. Because he had broken, he couldn't do it. So his son picks up his father's hand and lays it on his mother's leg, on her lap there in the, in the car. All bloody, all, you know. And they say that, he said, Brother Branham closed his eyes and opened them, and she began to breathe. William Branham raises his wife from the dead in the car. So by this time, the ambulance is coming. They take both to the hospital, and William Branham would die. His wife would live on for many years. But she had to heal from all of her broken bones and her wounds from the car wreck. And it took months for that to happen. And she did not want William Branham to be buried until she could attend the memorial service. She did, had not made the decision whether she wanted to live in Jeffersonville or in Tucson. And so she wanted him buried wherever she was going to be living. So they put him, 
I hate to say that, in cold storage, can I say it that way? They put him in a place of preservation so that at the right time they could have the memorial service, the wife could be there, and it could be at the request. So the governmental, local government agreed to it. So Brother Branham is on preservation, cold storage, if I can say it that way. I don't know what better word to say it as. And, and he sits there and uh, waits to be buried until his wife. So his wife recovers and decides that she wants to live in Jeffersonville, Indiana. So we're close to Easter. And so she says, we, they always had an Easter convention at the Branham Tabernacle, the Branham Church there. I don't know if we have a picture of the church. That might, you can just show it. And so they decided to wait to have the memorial service, Easter convention on Easter, being a Christian holy day and, and all of those things. So this is what the family decided at the request of the wife, the mother. All right, everybody still with me? Keep walking because now we're going to, it gets weirder as we go, folks. I, I wish it gets, but it gets weirder as we go. So all of these followers that had made Brother Brenham think he was Elijah and thought he was the, 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 that he was the last prophet of the, of the church age and he was the seventh seal uh, that was in the Bible and his name was 777, uh, the letters in it, had all mystified and, and all this stuff like that. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And, and so they all thought that Branham would come back to life and be raised from the dead on Easter. And so the news and the talk got into the newspapers and all over the body of Christ at that time that Branham was going to raise from the dead on Easter. So more people came to the Easter convention than normal expecting a resurrection. These would be the beginnings of what we would call the Brennanites, those that are extreme Branham followers. And we're going to qualify that in a minute. And so they, he did not come back to life. He's been dead since 1965. Uh, he died December 24th, Christmas Eve, 1965 was when Branham died. They buried him at Easter time on April the 11th, 19, um, 60, 1966, all right? That's when they buried him, all right? So all of his followers declared, Branham's coming back. And so, just go ahead and show the tombstone of the, of the triangle if you've got that. I want you to see his grave marker. To me, this is the most uncalled for grave marker that I've found in Pentecostal history. It is a pyramid. I don't think it's appropriate for a Christian minister to have a pyramid as a grave marker. All right? This is my personal opinion, so you can throw it out and you do whatever. And I've been there twice, and all sides of the pyramid have different statements and slogan, even to his heir, where he talks about him being one of the seven church fathers and part of the seven church ages. And there used to be a golden eagle on top, but people kept stealing the eagles. So they don't do that no more. And to this day, listen to this, to this day, they still show up at Easter time, a small group of them waiting for Branham to come out of the grave. There is something wrong with this picture. You've made a man a god and not made him a man of God. To this day, all over Africa, parts of America and the world, I have Brennanites that I've met. Now, some of them love my story of William Brennan until I get to this, and then they get mad at me and write me mean emails. How, we don't like you, you shouldn't do this. Yes, I should, because you're crazy. You are absolutely out of this world in a weird world. Now, let me explain why I say that. I went to a Branham service, a Brennanite service one time at William Branham's church where he actually, he would pastor and his memorial service was there. So I go there and it's a nice older building. It's not very large. It's a, it was a nice older building. It still looks old. And um, there's a picture, Brother Branham says, our pastor underneath it. It's a picture of Brother Branham in the foyer of the church. And you go in and sit down and they sing Christian songs from the 1960s and 70s. They have not updated the Hillsong or Jesus culture yet. They're still Back in, they stopped when Brother Branham died, and that's where they live in their, their music and their style. And But the music was great. I enjoyed it, and they gave the offering. They gave the church announcement just like a normal church. I thought, well, this is not bad. I thought, what's the problem? This is, this is okay. I mean, I like to update them and change them a little bit, but overall, I thought, no problem. I haven't got to the sermon yet. When it's time for the message, they play a recording of William Branham from 1950 or 60, because there's a lot of... Uh, cassette recordings of Branham in that time period. So every Sunday morning, Brother Branham 
preaches to them. And that's why they're still the pastor. They will listen to Branham's tapes over everything else and have very few live preachers. They play his tapes. Now, I love respecting people. I love honoring people. But that's idolatry and that is wrong. Now, if you're a part of the Branham group, walk out. If you're a Brennanite, walk out today and don't repent for leaving. Rejoice for leaving and go find you a good, healthy church and worship God there and let the word that they preach wash all the stupidness out of your head and heart so you can be free and happy again. Brother Branham is not coming back. He was a great prophet of God, no doubt about it, with signs, wonders, and tremendous gifts. But he got into error. False teaching, believing wrong identity, his friendship with Brother Lindsay was broken and not restored. That was a part of a divine relationship he should have kept. He was changing, I should teach this to you. He, he chose to change his office from prophet to teacher at his own will, not God's bidding. And that was his problem. He left where God had anointed him and called him. And he tried to be a teacher. And he taught all these false things and all these false doctrines at the end of his life. And it is a mistake that he made. Now, all the young prophets that follow prophetic ministries will all talk about William Branham. I have a concern that I'm going to voice to you, my students, and to you that are part of our ministry. I hope you've heard my respect for William Branham, my love for William Branham, my admiration for his amazing ministry, but I'm not going to not tell you the truth about the rest of his life. How you die is how you're remembered. Everybody starts off kind of funny and they got to get their life together and get going. So let's end well so our ending is our legacy. His did not end well. What you use as a young prophet will hear about William Branham. And it's okay. Read about him. Look at his life. But accept the reality he made a mistake or mistakes. But Brother Robert, he's prophetic. Maybe we don't understand. Yes, we do understand. It violated scripture. But, but, but he's, no, 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 no. Stop allowing the door of deception trying to make an error sound right in the name of the prophetic. Many people today are receiving prophetic words and things in their life that don't line up with the scriptures. And their whole life gets into a mess. And when you study a man like Brother Branham, receive from him, learn from him, be inspired by him, but also learn from his mistakes and do not follow him in his to total ministry or the same error that was on him may come upon you. And we don't want that to happen. Can you say amen to that? Learn from Branham to stick with the word. And if you're not a good word guy, then get a Gordon Lindsay or F.F. Bosworth to preach for you and you just do the miracles until you can learn how to preach better or have a better theology. Do not change offices at will. That is a major mistake. People think they can do what they want to do. There are some people, they should never teach the Bible. They should just sing hallelujah, get people healed and saved. Uh, they get into error because they try to do things they're not anointed and gifted to do by God. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's a simple statement of, uh, of truth, a principle to live by. But in the life of William Branham, that is his story tonight.